to continue our study in the book of Revelation this evening. And uh, <clears throat> do, do you have the handout? We have two handouts for study aids. One is a chart. We gave it out early, and you may have that. It uh, takes us through each chapter. Oh, you, need, you have one of those? You have one of these? Okay. Yeah, this one takes us through chapter by chapter and uh, sort of gives a, an overview or a heading of what each of the chapters is about. The second one is more of a, uh, a playbook. <laughs> it, uh, it lists the major events and characters that we will encounter in our study of the book of Revelation. And it gives you a little, uh, just an explanation of what it is. So you don't have to rely on your memory so much because this explains what, what it is. The event or, for instance, the black horse or the ashen horse or the white horse or whatever gives you an idea of, of what we're talking about. It, I'll bring it to you. Do you have this? Okay. Uh, you need, you're going to need one just for your own uh, study. And it's a good tool. It's by Robert Jeffress pastor First Baptist Church in Dallas, and he did a good job, and uh, it's a great tool. Uh, we'll go through it as we get to those events and, and things we'll look at, at his explanation. All right, so we're in uh, the book of Revelation, and we're moving now to the next phase of the book. The, the, the Revelation was written in the end of the first century, uh, somewhere around the year 96, A.D., we won't really argue about where you put it, but it was at the end of the first century, along with 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John writes it from the Isle of Patmos, and uh, the outline of the book is the things that you've seen, chapter 1, which is the risen Christ in his glory in heaven, that's chapter 1. Uh, chapters 2 and 3 are the messages to the seven churches, that's the things which are now, that is, at the time of the writing. In, at, at the end of the first century uh, when John was still on the Isle of Patmos, the things which are. And then the third portion of the book are the things which will take place after this. And beginning in chapter 4 to the end of the book, everything is future. What John saw on the Isle of Patmos in chapter 1 was at that time. He saw it in heaven, and he saw the, a, view of, uh, uh, a view of the risen Christ. And then in chapters 2 and 3, what he saw was on earth, but it was at that time. And now when we get to chapter 4, through the end of the book, he's writing about things that haven't happened yet, but that will hap happen after these things. They're yet future to the, the writing of John, to the, to the recipient of the letters in the seven churches of Asia Minor, and to us. So this still has not occurred. We'll, what I'm trying to tell you is we will see this unfold as we read it unfolding here. We will be witnesses of the same thing that John has witnessed. He's just given us a preview of what will take place at, uh, in the future. And so, let's see, uh, that's the basic outline of the book. Uh, the, the risen Christ revealed the message is the future. Uh, chapters 1 was the things in heaven. Uh, John's on the Isle of Patmos. The things which you have seen are the things in heaven. The things on earth are the message to the seven churches. And then ultimately, now we begin with the, the things that, you, that will take place after these things. The future reveals. All right. This is what we're going to read about. You can see that. We'll talk about the details of it. So we'll look with me at chapter 4, and let's just jump in and get our feet wet. Now, as we move from this phase of the book to the end of the book, we're going to encounter a number of uh, events and things that are difficult to understand. Uh, this is what John saw. He's merely recording what he saw. Some of it we can interpret. Some of it, I'll be honest with you, we can't. It's, we, it's either symbolic in some way, 
Or if we take it literally, it seems impossible. And so the way we're going to approach our understanding of the rest of the book is if we can interpret it literally, we're going to interpret it literally. Because this is what John saw and received and wrote. So if it's, if, if it's literal, we'll, we'll take literal. Some of it can't be literal, to be honest with you. It, it's impossible for it to be literally what he saw. So it must be representative of something else. And when we encounter that, we'll talk about what it might be. But we're not going to make it represent something until we can't interpret it literally. Okay, you understand what I'm trying to get you to see? If we can make it literal, we will. Because that's the way it was written. So when he says there are 144,000 witnesses, there are 144,000 witnesses. The number 144,000 doesn't represent a great mass of people that we don't know how many there were. No, we know how many there were. There were 144,000. That's what John said. Oh, yeah, he knew what it meant. Now, some of the symbolism, I don't know. He may have had greater insight than we do uh, as to what the symbolism meant, but he didn't elaborate on what the symbolism meant. For instance, when we get to the great harlot later in the book, uh, wh wh who is this harlot? And what, what form does she take? We'll, we'll talk about the struggle that we have when we get there. But we're going to have to realize that that's symbolic of something. There's not this great harlot out there, but it symbolizes something that has that kind of effect on humankind. And we'll, we'll get into the details of that. So that's what I'm talking about. If we can take it literally, we're going to. If it says there are 24 elders, there are 24 elders. If it says there's four living creatures, there's just four living creatures. There's not ten. There's not a dozen. There's just four. So we're going to be literal as often as we can, and then when we get can't, we'll struggle with what we're talking about. So as we open the, open the book, uh, open the, the fourth chapter, the scene changes. No longer is John going to be on earth, and he's, neither is he going to be talking about things on earth like the seven churches. Now he's going to be talking about things that he sees in heaven. So the scene has changed to heaven, from earth to heaven. So John says in chapter 4, verse 1, After these things, after what things? After the messages that I received to the seven churches of Asia Minor, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. So the scene's going to change. We're no longer going to be on the Isle of Patmos and talking about events that are taking place over there around Ephesus and Philadelphia and Laodicea and Sardis and Pergamum and all of those, Smyrna. No, we're going to shift our view to a heavenly view. And let me tell you now, when you go through the doors of heaven, you've got to put on a new set of glasses. Why? Because things there are not like things here. They're quite different. And John is going to be alarmed, and we're going to be alarmed at some of the things that we see. So he saw a door standing open in heaven, and he heard the first voice. Well, the only voice that John has heard in the book of Revelation so far, we understand from chapter 1, verse 10, John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice. It sounded like a trumpet, and it was behind me. And I turned, and when I looked at the voice, I saw the Son of Man. So he, heard, he hears the same voice, is all that we're trying to say. John, it's the same voice that I originally heard, and now it says with new instructions, come up here. Now, where is John on the Isle of Patmos? Come up here, and I will show you things which, notice the little word. If you write in your Bible, circle the word must. Because when we see that word in the Greek New Testament, it's the little Greek word, D-E-I-D-I. But it means of divine necessity. It means God is assuring us with the use of this word that what happens next is going to take place. It must take place. More emphatically, it will take place. Why? It's by divine design. God has designed all of the things that John's about to write, and they must take place. They cannot be circumvented. They must take place. And so, 
come up here and I will show you the things that must take place. And immediately upon being instructed to come, I, John, was in the Spirit. Well, what in the world does that mean? Does that mean that he ha is in a state of spiritual sensitivity right there on the Isle of Patmos? And all of a sudden, through that new sensitivity, he's able to glean a vision of something that's, that's in heaven? Perhaps. The word that's translated in the Spirit can also be translated by. It's a little word in, in, by, with, among. There are four possible interpretations of that word. So what if it was by the Spirit? So I, John, by the Spirit, that is the aid of the Holy Spirit, was able to see a vision that was in heaven. So John's not in heaven. He's on the Isle of Patmos. But what he sees is beyond the door that opened to heaven. And now he's seeing heavenly things take place. And so he saw a throne in heaven. And this is what's depicted up here by uh, an artist. And her name is right there. And she does, a, in my opinion, she does a really good job of trying to interpret what we're reading and put it in art form. So this is a, this is a piece of art that she created from her own imagination based on what she read here. And I thought she did a pretty good job. I mean, it, it describes everything that we're going to see. Will it look like this? No. No. This is just her idea. And it's a pretty good idea. But when we see it, it's not going to be anything like this. It's going to be far more than this picture could ever capture. It's going to be beyond our imagination. It's going to blow our hair back when we see it. It's going to be so spectacular. So, I was in the Spirit. There was a throne, and there was one seated, continually seated in the Greek text, continually sitting perhaps, a throne, and one continually sitting on the throne, and the one who sat there, he begins to describe what he looked like. He said, you know, to me, as I saw it with my own eyes, I said, it looked like jasper, that is, a diamond. It had the, it had the brightness and the clarity of the most thing that I can think of is a diamond. What's that big diamond? That's the hope diamond? Is that the most? Is that the, wow, can you imagine? It must have looked like to him the hope diamond. I don't think John ever saw the hope diamond. But it looked like a diamond that was so spectacular. That's the only way he could describe what he saw. Perhaps that represents the pure holiness of God. And the only way John could describe the holiness of God was, man, it looked like a giant diamond to me, guys. And not only did it look like a giant diamond, but he said also the one who sat on the throne had the appearance of a sardis stone. A sardis stone is a deep red like a ruby. About, about like the color of a ruby. It's a rich red color. And perhaps the red color that he saw around the throne, she depicts it as a circle up there. And the diamond, or the uh, clear one, is the, is the throne room, is the throne itself. And perhaps the, if, the, if the diamond represents the holiness of God, perhaps the emerald look, I mean the ruby look, represents the wrath of God because that's what's fixing to happen we're fixing to see the wrath of God on display like it's never been displayed before in all of human history or in all of scripture the only time the wrath of God was visibly seen on earth was the flood what happened God says man the, the thoughts of their heart are evil continually I don't have to put up with this I'm going to destroy everything on earth Except Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, eight people. And the wrath of God came upon planet earth and the inhabitants of the earth. And all were destroyed except eight. And that's a depiction of the wrath of God. And perhaps to view it before it actually is unleashed, it would appear like a ruby. A giant deep colored red that's about to be unleashed humankind and so that's what he saw and that's what it looked like and then around it was a rainbow now I didn't know till not too long ago that a rainbow is actually 360 degrees if you see the whole thing I thought it was always an arc in the sky but it's 360 degrees and so around the throne where the God Almighty is seated on that throne 
he sees, as it were, a rainbow that appeared to him like an emerald in its color. It didn't have the colors of the rainbow as we see them, but it had the appearance of a rainbow that was all one color. It was an emerald, a green color. I don't know how to interpret that, except that it, it describes the, the majesty of God in some way. Uh, but I'm, I can't wait to see it for myself. Now, you remember when we studied in Acts on Sunday night, the stoning of Stephen? You remember what Stephen said? He said, I'm looking up into heaven and I see Jesus, and he's right at the right hand of the Father. Well, that's what he saw. Only he saw Jesus at the right side of that throne place of authority and honor and so when we arrive in heaven folks this is what we're going to see that's what the throne room of God looks like and it's going to look like until we until we take up our new home and the new Jerusalem on planet on the new heavens and the new earth so that's what heaven looks like if you're wondering only this is just a small glimpse of what it looks like it's going to be something to behold so what about around the throne? There was a lot of activity going on around this throne. And perhaps the throne itself is in, uh, the writer of Hebrews says that in heaven there is a heavenly tabernacle or a heavenly temple. And if the heavenly temple is in any way like the earthly tabernacle or the temple, then it has an outer a region, a sanctuary, and then it has a holy of holy where God dwells. Perhaps this throne room is the holy of holies of heaven. It's where God dwells continually from his throne, a place of absolute sovereignty and authority. From his throne, he rules the universe. Not a star shoots across the sky, but God doesn't send it on its way. Not a lightning bolt strikes from a cloud until God says, hit that spot right there. He controls all of his creation from his throne. This is the command central of the universe that John is given a glimpse of. And there are more things in heaven and her ratio than we could come up with in our own mind. <laughs> and we're going to get a few pictures of them here. So around this throne, verse 4 says, there were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders. And so here she depicts them as seated around the throne. 24 she refers to them as elders. An elder was an office in the early church. It was the pastor of the church at Philadelphia, at Sardis, at Ephesus, at Philippi, in Rome. Later they became known as the Bishop of Rome, the Bishop of Ephesus, the Bishop of Smyrna, the Bishop of Pergamum. But the, the technical title in, in the New Testament is the word elder. And so on these thrones, he sees what he describes as elders. Now, there's a great debate about who they are. Who are these guys? Well, let's read a little bit about them. First of all, uh, uh, on the throne, there were 24 elders. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders seating. How are they dressed? In white robes. Well, let's see if we can figure out what in the world does the white robe refer to. In the book of Revelation itself, if I turn over a page or two to the sixth chapter, I want you to turn there with me because we're interested in now who gets a white robe. What's the white robe all about? And so uh, when we arrive at chapter six, we're dealing with the opening of the sealed uh, scroll that we're going to see in a moment. And uh, when the fifth seal's open, there appears in heaven martyrs. Individuals from the period of tribulation who have died because of their faith. So they've been martyred on earth. And now their bodies have been laid to rest on earth. And they're in the presence of the Lord. Because here they are under the altar of this throne. Man, they're right down there at the feet of the throne. And the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they held. And they cried out to the Lord saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood upon those who dwell on earth? They said, look, we got a question for you. Man, we suffered. We were persecuted and tormented and tortured and eventually killed. How long are you going to let them get away with that? 
Well, that sounds like a fair question. That's what I'd want to know. If we were being persecuted, Lord, how long are you going to let them get away with this? And the answer comes back until the last of those, or your fellow servants, who will be killed in the same way you were is complete. When everybody who's been persecuted has been persecuted to death, don't you worry, I'll take care of it. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And payback is mm, bad. So what about these guys? Look at verse 11. They were given a white robe to each of them. They were given a white robe. And then when we skip to the seventh chapter, verse 9, after these things, John says, I looked and there was a great multitude that couldn't even be numbered from among the nations, the tribes, the peoples, the tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And what are they wearing? Clothed in white robes. Who are they? Back up and look. They're inhabitants of earth. They're earth dwellers. How do you know? Well, because they have their nationalities, their tribes, their people, their tongues. Those are all describing human qualities. We have ethnicity. We have language. We have color. We have a variety of things. That's what makes us different. And so what he says, somebody from all of these distinctions on earth is represented there, and they're in white robes. So who's wearing the white robes? Human beings are wearing Believers are wearing the white robe, okay? Now, Jesus said in Ephesians chapter 5 that he gave, husbands love your wives in the same way that he loved the church and gave himself for her so that, or with the result, that he may present the church to himself a bride spotless and without stains. Well, these are wearing Pure white robes, spotless and without stain. So, my point is this. Who wears white robes? Believers. Believers wear white robes. Now, one of the suggestions of these 24 elders is that 12 of the elders are, are each of the 12 sons of Jacob plus the 12 apostles. And now you've got 24 elders around the throne. This difference is the 12 apostles were of the bride of Christ the 12 sons of Jacob were the wife of Jehovah so it's not quite the same group although they're in the same class of believers it's not the same group of believers so I believe that these represent the church itself now who are they well I'm sure one of them must be Billy Graham I mean it's got to be somebody that I don't, I don't know who it is. I don't know if Billy Graham made it to that group or not. It seems to be an elite group, and they seem to represent all the rest of us. Well, you got more than you can ever count <laughs> of that particular group. So we're, I'm going to come to the conclusion it's saints. Others have said, well, it's angels. Well, they're wearing crowns, folks. Did you notice in the, you see the crowns on their head? And in a little bit, they're going to do something with those crowns. And you remember what Paul promised us? He said, look, guys, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've completed the course. I kept the faith. And guess what? There's laid up for me a crown of righteous, a stephanos, a wreath, not the diadem. Jesus wears the diadem. We get a stephanos. A wreath of recognition, of accomplishment, for reward. And Paul says, I, there is laid up for me a Stephanos of righteousness, but not for me only, but for all who love his appearing. So we're going to all get crowns of one kind or another. And these individuals are all wearing crowns. So it seems to me that we ought to interpret it to mean representatives, some 24 of the church at large who have are dressed in their robes of white they have received their crown what does that mean that means we have already experienced the bema judgment of christ why because that's when we get our rewards and they have their rewards and they're seated in thrones around him in honor of what he accomplished on their behalf and our behalf through his death on the cross 
And so we're going to see something about those crowns in just a moment. And so look at the next verse. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did. Oh, I'm reading in the wrong place. (laughs) That was the ones who, that was the martyrs. Let's go back to chapter 4. Uh, behold the throne, uh, there, there, were, there were the, the 24 elders with golden crowns, golden Stephanos on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Does that ring a bell to you from any place? Let me back you up to the book of Exodus. When Moses took the children out of, out of uh, Egypt, he led them out into the wilderness. They walked three months till they came to Mount Sinai. And when they got to the bottom of Mount Sinai, God said, I want you to come up here. I got a few instructions for y'all. Moses says, okay, what you want me to tell the people? You tell them, take a bath, clean their clothes, and don't touch the foot of the mountain. In fact, you better put a ring around there so they don't touch it. Because if they touch the mountain, they're going to die. Why? Because I'm going to be at the top of the mountain. If I'm on the mountain, the mountain's holy. And if you're not clean, don't touch the mountain. So don't touch the mountain. And then he called Moses up. But look what happened when Moses went up. So it says in verse 16 of the 19th chapter, It came to pass on the third day in the early morning, there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of a trumpet was so loud that the people who were at the foot of the mountain trembled. Wow, what an astounding representation of the fact that God's on the top of that mountain. Now look when we get to the book of Revelation. What do we see? We see from the throne preceded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Wow. That's God himself, folks. Who's on that throne? The Father. Almighty God. Same one who was on the mountain with Moses. How do we know? Same kind of things are happening. Lightning flashes. Thunderings and rumble. And a voice like the sound of many waters. And there was before the throne uh, seven spirits of God. Here they are. They look like lamps. They're right here in front of the throne of God. If I can find that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, that's something else we have to interpret. The Holy Spirit is referred to as the seven spirits in the book of Isaiah. That is the seven perfections of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps it's the representation of the Trinity here because in a moment we're going to see the Son. Right now we've seen the Father. He's, he's that bright light in the middle. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit could be represented by these seven bowls of fire. <clears throat> or others have said these are the judgments that are about to be poured out. And perhaps it is the seven last vile judgments that come from the, the scroll of judgment that we're about to open in a little while. I don't know. I prefer to think that it's the Holy Spirit. It's a representation of the Holy Spirit present. And in this depiction of heaven, we're going to see the Trinity. We've seen the Father. He's sitting right there on the throne. We've seen the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is like the Father, Spirit, so we only see a representation of Him. Right? You with me on that? The only physical member of the Trinity that we'll ever see in heaven is Jesus. Because he took human form. And he's always going to have a human form. But the Father is spirit. You must worship him in spirit because he's spirit. The Holy Spirit is spirit. They don't have form. They don't have, they're not tangible, but they are. And so they have to have a representation of the, of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps if this is that representation. Just to declare to us that the Trinity is involved in this whole thing. And in a moment, as I said, in chapter 5, we're going to be introduced to the Son. Now, that's not the only thing that are around the throne. Now we get to the part that really throws us a curveball. When we get to the, the sixth verse, there was a sea of glass, and it looked like crystal. It was clear, in other words, and it appears to be solid and not liquid. Uh, and in the midst of of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and in the back. Well, now remember, John was describing what he saw. And so this imagery that he saw must represent something. So there are four living beings. We've got that much. They're referred to here as creatures, but they're living beings. 
and they appear to have eyes everywhere. So what might that mean? It might mean that they're that they're they, they see everything, nothing escapes their notice. They're not omniscient because only God knows all things. So it doesn't represent omniscience, but it could represent complete awareness. It could represent that they have uh, uh, alertness. I don't know. When we get there, we'll ask somebody that's been there for a long time, what do all those eyes really mean? But they mean something because John saw them, and that's the way they appeared to him. And because they appeared that way, they represent something about, their, about who they are and what they do. Now, we know there's only four, and we know that they're the closest thing to the throne. They're closer than anything else to the throne where God's seated. And so the first uh, living creature was like a lion. Can you see the faces of these things? Here's the lion. Here's the ox. Here's the man. And here's the eagle. So they appeared. They were very similar creatures, but they, their, the face portion of them was different. It had, it, it, they had a different appearance. Perhaps they're representing something. Perhaps the lion represents power. He's the, he's the king of the jungle. And perhaps the ox represents uh, servitude or work. What do they use oxen for? To till the ground, to pull the wagons. Perhaps it represents service or strength. Uh, the man, intelligence. The eagle, swiftness. And they're also the highest of each of the orders. But what exactly they mean, we don't know. But I'll tell you this, if you go back and read Ezekiel, you'll find the same description. There were four living creatures. And they looked like a man. And they looked like a lion. And they looked like an eagle. And they looked like an ox. So they've been there since at least the time of Ezekiel. I think they've been there since the beginning, since the creation of the angelic creation. These are the highest of the hierarchy of angels. This is as high as it gets to be the one who stands in the presence of the Almighty. There's no greater honor than to be created to stand in the presence of the Almighty. They're not guardians of the throne because God doesn't need guarding. <laughs> He doesn't need to guard standing duty. So they serve something else, and it, it explains to us what they were. So here we go, verse 8. The four living creatures had wings, six in number, and they were full of eyes. We've already discussed that. And, and they didn't rest day or night. They were inexhaustible. How would you like to stay up day and night all the time? Well, we couldn't do it, could we? No. Sleep would catch up with us, and we would we'd be standing somewhere just it'd catch up. But not these not these creatures. Day and night, day after day, night after night, they're alert, aware, and at the ready, and they always say the same thing. You know what they say? Look at what it says in verse eight. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The unchanging God who always was, is right now, and will forever be the same unchanging God. They constantly declare the holiness of God. And not just the holiness, but to say the word three times means that the ultimate holiness of God this is that distinctive character or perfection of God that op supersedes everything else. And that's his holiness. Holy is the Lord. Folks, if we understood exactly what that meant, we would tremble in our boots. You remember when Isaiah was caught up into heaven in Isaiah chapter 6? He was caught up into heaven. And the first thing he said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and here I stand before a God who is holy. In other words, who am I to be here in this place, in your presence? Not me. He took a coal of fire and touched his tongue and purified him. And now he could stand in the presence of a holy God. Unrighteousness, evil, sin cannot exist in the presence 
of the holiness of God. It's consumed by the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy. And one day we're going to hear that because they're not ever going to stop proclaiming it. Never. This is a perpetual praise. God desires praise from his creatures, and these four perpetually praise him in his presence. He's never, it's never silent in heaven is what I'm trying to get you to see. There's always the proclamation of the holiness of God. And whenever, now here's the key part. Whenever the four living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne, the one living forever and ever, what did the 24 elders do? They fell down. They prostrated themselves. That's what that means, folks. They laid out in the presence of the one who alone was worthy. They were like Isaiah. Who am I? Who am I to be here in this place, in your presence? And they bow down, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And then the last phrase, what does it say they did with those crowns, those rewards? They cast their thrones before the throne. They cast their crowns before the throne. They took those crowns off. They said, yeah, we were given these, Paul included. And they cast their crowns before the throne and the feet of the one seated on the throne. And they cry out now, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory and power. Why? Because you created all things. And by your will they existed and were created. In other words, we're here because of you. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We were your creatures whom you rewarded for faithfulness. And now we give you that reward back because if it hadn't been for you, we wouldn't have got it in the first place. You alone are worthy. Folks, when we enter the gates of heaven, we're going to cry holy. I promise we're going to cry holy. You can't help but cry holy because you've come now into the presence of the Holy One. Everything changes. We have a new view and a new vision and a new set of glasses to see what eternity is like and what Almighty God is like. And I guarantee you, we're going to fall on the ground and cry holy. And we're going to throw any crowns and everything else that we might have received at the feet of the one who purchased us with his own blood. Well, there's been one absence. It's absent. We've seen the Father seated on the throne. We've seen the representation of the Holy Spirit before the throne. We've seen the angelic creation around the throne. We've seen the representatives of the church around the throne. But there's a person missing from the scene. Who is it? It's Jesus. We haven't seen Jesus yet. Not in this vision of heaven. And so we're now we're introduced to him. And chapter 5 says, I saw at the right hand of the one who sat on the scroll uh, of the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the outside, and sealed with seven seals. So the next thing that he notices out of all of this scenery, the next thing that he notices is a scroll. Now, this is a scroll with seven seals. Now, we're going to discuss when we get to the scroll and start opening it, if there's any other way it could have been sealed. But as you can see... Beginning with seal number one, if you remove this seal, you can only unroll the scroll as far as seal number two. And when you break seal number two, you can only unroll the scroll as far as seal number three. Number four, number five, number six, and number seven. And so the seals on the scroll are going to be broken in sequence, one through seven. Uh, last week, I think that's, an, uh, that's another, now it's in the right hand of the Father, he holds everything that's in the scroll in his right hand. He's going to do something with that scroll in a minute. But this, well, let's see, do I have a, I guess I don't. I'll have to find it for you. I have a picture somewhere here of a seal uh, that was discovered two weeks ago in Jerusalem beneath the southern wall. And it's intact. It's a little bitty seal. I'll have to find it and show it to you. Maybe if we get through here in a minute, I'll try but anyway, let's see what happens to this. The Father is holding in his right hand or at his right side. You won't see a hand because there's nothing to see. 
but the scroll is at the right side of the, of the Holy One who is receiving all praise. And uh, it's, it's, it's locked with seven seals. And, I, and then a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? Let someone step up if you're worthy to open the seals of the book. John saw, well, I wonder who that's going to be. Which one of these elders is going to get up? Maybe one of the four living creatures is going to turn around and take hold of it. But look at verse 3. No one in heaven or even on earth or even beyond the earth among those who are dead was able to open the scroll or even look upon it. Guess what? Nobody's worthy to open that scroll. And yet it's an important scroll. It contains something that must be opened, but we don't have anybody qualified to open it. No human being, no angelic creature, no dead person that exists under the earth. So John begins to cry. He knows that this is significant. It's in the right hand of the Almighty. It's got to be important. But we don't have anybody that go, how will we ever know? And so I wept much. He, I mean, he boo-hoos because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look at it. And one of the elders turned to me and said, look, quit crying, John. Look over there. Behold, the lamb of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the one who has prevailed. He will open the scroll and its seven seals. So John looks. He said, I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and the midst of the four living creatures, and in the midst of all the elders, there stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, with which the seven spirits of God are sent out into all the earth. Who is this? Jesus. You remember what Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 28, verse 19? You remember what he said? All authority has been given to me. Where? In heaven and on earth. How much authority was given to him? All authority. He's the only one that had the authority to take the scroll. The only one who had the authority to open the scroll. The only one who had the authority to unleash the judgments of the scroll. Why? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he is the only one that can take the scroll. And so he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of the one who sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders Fell down again, they prostrate themselves before the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, when he sees Jesus, he sees Jesus in everything that he represents. First of all, he sees him as a lamb who was slain. Well, what does that represent? His earthly ministry. Who, what did John say? Behold, over there, guys, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The one whom God sent to be a sacrifice. If he's going to become a sacrifice, he must die. And so he depicts him as a lamb wounded. Why? Because he died for us. But that's not all that he is. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. How'd you like to meet a lion in the jungle? Mm mm. Me neither. Why? Fierce. Yeah. So he comes this time as the, uh, the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah that cannot be resisted in his fierceness. Now he comes representing the wrath of God. And so that's what John sees. And having seen that, the 24 elders fell down along with the four living creatures. That means they bowed down. They prostrated themselves. We don't do that. You know, I noticed the other day, I, I don't know, I, sometimes I watch stuff on, on YouTube and I was watching a little bit of the coronation of King Charles in England, after Queen Elizabeth passed away, the corn, uh, he, he had his coronation. And when he first appeared in his regal regalia with his crown, carrying his scepter, and he walked through the, those in attendance at his coronation, and they sang the national anthem, which is God Save the King. So they're singing God Save the King. And as he 
came to where the people were seated in the, in the chancellery. As he passed down the middle aisle, the men did this, and the women curtsied. Why? This is a king. I mean, he, his bloodline goes back to the, what, 13th century or something like that? He goes way back. I mean, he, you know, if royal blood's worth anything, it's worth a lot to, <laughs> to that family. Because they're the descendants of royalty. And so they pay him homage. But that's about all we see take place here on earth. But let me tell you something. When we see it in heaven, we're going to be down there on our hands and knees doing it. This is not good enough for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're going to fully prostrate ourselves in honor of his, his who he is and his, his claim to authority. He is authority. And each of us at that time has a harp and golden bowls full of incense. And the bowls of the incense represent the prayers of the saints. Did you ever stop and think that when you pray, what it looks like? You know, you sit down and you, you think your prayer if it's private prayer or you say it out loud if it's in church or at the dinner table. But do you ever stop and think what your prayer actually looks like? You mean our prayer has an appearance? Yeah, it has an appearance. What does it look like? It looks like incense ascending to heaven. So the words of our thoughts or the words of our mouth, as they leave us, they appear as incense, and they have an aroma that is pleasing to God. Why? Because we're calling on Him. We're recognizing, Lord, in this situation, we need you. We're calling on you for help, for the meal that's been prepared, for whatever our prayers include. But they go up to heaven, they ascend like smoke of incense. And when the priests would go into the sanctuary of the temple at the hour of prayer, they would burn incense over the altar of incense, and the incense and the aroma going up through the tabernacle represented the prayers of the people that were taking place in the courtyard. And they went up to God as a sweet-smelling aroma, as his people turned to him for all that he offers. And that's exactly what John sees. Man, they had these bowls, but they were full of the prayers of the saints. You know, I wonder, based on this, if they collect certain prayers in certain categories. Because God doesn't answer every prayer the same, does he? No. He answers them according to his will and according to his time. Well, what are they praying for? They're praying for this judgment that's about to come. The same thing that the martyrs asked for. Oh, Lord, how long will you let this evil endure? How long will this go on? How long will this immorality take place? How long will we as a nation thumb our nose at the Almighty? How long will we keep aborting babies in their mother's womb? How long? And the prayers go up. And they're collected. And they're now brought before the Almighty God who's about to unleash His anger upon all evil and unrighteousness. And so the prayers of the saints that ask God how long now are offered up. And they come before God as a unit of those who have prayed that prayer into the presence of God like smoke rising from an incensor. And now they come to the throne of God. And as a result, look at verse 9. There is jubilation in heaven. And they, who? The ones who offered the prayers, the elders. That's why I think this has got to be the church, folks. It's got to be the church. And they sang a new song. Now, it's not new because it's never been written down. It's fresh. It's, it's of, a, of, a, of a unique kind of quality. But it's not a new song. It's an old song sung anew. And it says, you are worthy to take the scroll. And you are worthy to open its seals. Why? Because you were slain and you have redeemed us. Now, who's singing? The redeemed. And who are the redeemed? The elders and all of us who are then present. Now, remember, we're in this group, folks. They're waiting on us for all this to take place. We're among the singers. We're among the crown casters. We're 
you're among those who bow before the Lord our God and give him all praise. You have redeemed us by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There's not a representative group on earth that doesn't have someone who's come to faith. Wow, that's a testimony to the gospel of Christ. Remember he said, well, I want you to take it to the ends of the earth. Well, we do because they're all in this group as a result of the gospel. And you've made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. When you reign, we have a place. Robert and I are going to be the dog catchers in Eustace. I'm going to work one day, and he's going to work the next. <laughs> John's going to be a golf course manager. John Trent. Yeah, sure, he's going to use our, the skills that we've mastered down here. I don't know how he'll choose what we get to do, but this guarantees that when he reigns, we're going to have a part in that some way. One way or another, we're involved in it. So, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels. Now, to the voice of the elders, the saints of God, the church, are added the voice of many angels around the throne, as well as the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and on top of that, thousands of thousands. Now, that's a bunch. That's a bunch of people. Can you imagine what that will sound like, Robert? What a choir. You talk about the Norman, Norman Tabernacle Choir doing such a good job. What do you think this choir is going to sound like? All of our voices in perfect harmony. Can you imagine how heaven will resonate with the sound of that many voices? You remember a few years ago I played for us uh, a recording of 10,000 men in, in uh, Wales who sang, uh, what did they sing? Anyway. And it, it, it was overwhelming, just the sound of that many voices at once. And we're talking about, you can't even count the number of voices that will be singing the glory of God. Wow. We're liable to just burst out in tears at just the sound around us. And knowing that our voices are included. Wow. We're part of that great number who praise God. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands upon thousands and they said with a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing comes out of Handel's Messiah by the way although he stole it from the scripture <laughs> hey we, he might even get to lead us in something wouldn't it be great if Handel led us in the hallelujah chorus Lord have mercy and we all could sing our parts Without the music? <laughs> I bet Nancy said, could I accompany that? Nancy and Carrie would be over there on the instruments taking turns. Can you imagine in heaven, think about all, the, all of the skilled and creative people on this earth. Those who paint, sculpt, architecture, music. All believers who are now joined together in heaven and can combine our creative abilities to praise God. Can you imagine what they might come up with? Man, if Handel wrote the Messiah down here, what in the world is he going to write in heaven? It's got to blow us away. Because I don't think we're going to lose all that creative ability, and I don't think we're going to waste it. I think we're going to put it to its ultimate use, to the praise and glory of God. And I can't wait to see who directs the choir. I wonder if Gabriel is going to be the leader of the choir, the choir director, Robert. You know, there'd be a big fight among the rest of us. <laughs> no, it's my turn. No, it isn't. Yeah, it is. You did it last Sunday. <laughs> no, there won't be any fighting in heaven. But uh, it'll be glorious. And we'll all use our skills. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea. And all of them I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and forever. Somewhere included in this 
is the fulfillment of uh, Philippians where it says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And that's what John's referring to here when all this other group in, in join their voices to the voices in heaven giving praise to God. And what happens next? Verse 14, the four living creatures said, Amen. That's all that's left to say. You know what amen means? It means I agree 110%. So I'm with you on that, buddy. That's what amen means. And so the four living creatures, having heard the sound of the saints and the angels and the earth, say amen. We couldn't do it any better. That's what it is. And the four 424 elders fell down again and worshiped the one who lives forever and ever and ever. People want to know what we're going to do in heaven. Folks, it's a busy time. We're not going to run out of things to do. In fact, it's a good thing we don't have to take naps to catch up and have enough rest to do them. It's going to be a full program. It's going to be like going on a cruise and have somebody say, you're going to do all these things before you get back to port. They're going to give us a handout. Here's what we're going to be doing right now. Which side of the choir are you going to sing in? This one or that one? All right. Any questions or comments before we close? Now, remember, these are just art, artist ideas, but they're very creative ideas, and they do help us envision. But what we see is going to be so much beyond what's been, what we're looking at that it's going to be unimaginable to our eyes. Can't wait to see it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the little rain that came our way, Lord. Every little bit's needed, and we appreciate what we got. We want you to know we thank you, and we want you to know, Lord, we love you. And we want to express our praise even now in the way that we will express it when we get there. Lord, we want to give you our very best. We want to offer you uh, the best that we can do when we sing, the best that we can do when we pray, the best that we can do when we study your word, because we want to give you the honor and the glory and the power that is due your name. We want to do it now. And we pray that you'll give us the the presence of your spirit to guide us in all that we do for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you.